Hi everybody, this is Steve Ludwig, host of Steve Ludwig's Classic Pop Culture and the Beatles Hour with Steve Ludwig at planetludwig.com. Here's an interview we did with Ken Sagos on September 30th, 2014. It's from show number 60. To hear the entire show, check out the menu at planetludwig.com. And now, please enjoy the interview. Our next guest is an award-winning writer, actor, producer, director with over a hundred film, TV, and stage credits. He studied writing and directing under Edmund J. Cambridge and Marlon Brando. He's a Cable Ace Award winner. He's written, at last count, this may already be um, uh, undercounting, 14 plays and over 35 screenplays. He's received an NAACP theater nomination for Ted Lang's play, George Washington's Boy. He's also known for John Singleton's Rosewood as the lovable character, Big Baby. And the role of Daryl with Martin Lawrence in the hit series, What's Happening Now? His latest project is called The Secret Weapon. We're going to be speaking about that in a few minutes. But you probably know Ken Sagos best from his role as Kincaid, the soft-spoken Kincaid in Nightmare on Elm Street Parts (laughs) parts 3 and 4. It is such a pleasure to welcome our guest, Mr. Ken Sagos. Ken, welcome to the show. (laughs) Welcome. (laughs) I'm (laughs) soft-spoken. Oh, you know what? I might have had you confused with the... uh, the character that was mute. I'm sorry. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, they go to Tom, so the King Kate is by far. Yes, yes, that's right. There is, there is the line for sure. Uh, Ken, it's so nice to uh, to speak with you. We're gonna get into Nightmare on Elm Street and some of your other projects um, in a bit. But boy, I, I saw this Indiegogo um, pro, uh, project that you have for the Secret Weapon, and. Um, could you please let our listeners know what it's all about? And then I have my list of questions about it. It's such a great, uh, great uh, thing that you're doing here. So, Ken, welcome to the show, and let us know about The Secret Weapon first. Well, well The Secret Weapon is, is a very special project. It's, it's, I want to first do it as a short film and hope that it parlay into a feature film, which I really, really believe that it is. And I'm trying to raise funds to shoot this film. And I'm trying to start off by raising 15000 I really need double that. So... But the story is an amazing story about some children in 1963 who gave power back to the civil rights movement. And what these children did was seen all over the world. So this is not just an American story. This is a worldly story. And, you know, as you know, I was a nightmare on Elm Street. I'm, I'm famous for being one of the dream warriors. Well, the truth of the matter is these children was the first dream warriors and this was reality and the man that they had to face was a man uh, known as the legendary boy connor and just look him up he's called he's one of the most legendary powerful races of his time he was right there with j edgar hoover Hoover was his buddy Mm. and to me he was the original freddy krueger so Mm. You know, this may not be a horror film in the sense that we like to watch horror, but it's certainly a horror for what they did, was doing to the South and to those children and what those children had to do. And what those children did, like I said, was seen all over the world. And and for those, uh, I'm going to direct this short, and I wrote this short. And for many of you all who don't know, I'm not just an actor. I'm an award-winning um, writer, you know, Absolutely. technically I have an Emmy, which is a Cable Ace Award, and I have a Humanitas Award. Those are the prestigious awards that's on the level of the Police Surprise. So, but it's basically about children who went head to head and stood up for their rights, which uh, affected the world, and which is the reason that we have the power of the civil rights movement today. And as you know, the civil rights movement helps everybody across the board. It helps blacks, it helps whites, it helps women, it helps gays. They gave the power back. And it's one of those stories that they may talk about in a movie, but it's never been anything done or presented dramatically about those children. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. For those, you know, I'll tell you, Ken. Um, what I liked, I, I, I watched the uh, the the promo. Um, it it gives a a view I've never 
seen before through children's point of view? No, no, no. It, it happened. It's it never been done. And, um, you know, and, and this is so important with what's going on in the world today, you know, in Ferguson and and all the world with these young people, you know, some don't have pride, some do have pride. And but this is a story that I think the family can watch, everybody can watch and feel um, proud about. And incidentally, the, what I won the award for, the um, Cable Ace Emmy Award for, was for a Disney film. So I'm used to writing about children mm-hmm. and, you know, writing it from their point of view. And I believe that this will be one of the first uh, dramatic pieces that's truly written from young people part of view in their eyes, you know, of children who gave something back. Right. Um, we're sp- everyone we're speaking with, award-winning writer, producer, director, actor, uh, Ken Sagos. And we're talking about his project, The Secret Weapon. And um, I urge all my listeners to please contribute to the project. It's such a word- worthy project. Um, I'll, give, I'll give you all the website. But an easier thing to do, everyone, is just Google Indie Go Go. The Secret Weapon. It'll bring you right to the website. But it's Indiegogo.com backslash projects backslash the dash secret dash weapon. The Secret Weapon. But like I said, it's easy to go to Google. Just Google Indiegogo, The Secret Weapon. It'll take you right there. I just checked as we were speaking uh, with Ken, and, and that'll take you right there. And I urge everybody to uh, to contribute. You know, Ken, um, I spent, uh, I'm a retired teacher. I taught for 38 years, eighth grade. And this is a project, this is a movie that I think would fit in every single school curriculum. I think that that's another audience that I think this is so important to reach, The Secret Weapon. Yes. And and the reason that I want to direct this short and I wrote this short in a particular way is that it does have a beginning, a middle and an end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you go to the um, page, um, the Indigo page, if you scroll down, you can actually read a scene from the uh, script. Mm -hmm. And that scene is centered around a four-year-old kid. This man, Bo O'Connor, put children in hog pens, and he put a four-year-old child in hog pens. So Mm. this story Mm. has been embraced by teachers, by social workers, by everybody. And I have to say this about the horror community. They are really coming to bat for me, Uh. and they have really uh, been supporting me. And, you know, and I want to give a special thank after this. And if I ever win an award, you can hear it right here. One of the first people I must thank is God. But also mm-hmm. I have to thank the my family, the horror community. But, you know, Ken, it's I'm glad you said that because I'm I'm horror films are my favorite genre and I go to a lot of horror conventions. And I, I think horror fans, like you said, are some of the most passionate and knowledgeable fans of that genre. And You'd think, gee, horror fans, these guys are off the wall. But that's some of the nicest, most approachable people. And, and I'm so glad to hear you say that about that. You see that in, in, in the conventions, huh, with the horror fans? You, you, you see it in the convention, convention, and I must say I have seen it here. Those that can't afford it, they're wishing you well. And they're not just wishing you well. They're, they're writing little stories, and they're doing what they can. They realize the importance of this story, and you know, and when you, the horror community, you know, there's some people and PhDs all over in all levels. And, you know, sometimes people have this thing about the horror community that they they just don't think, they don't do anything. But let me tell you something. I believe the most together, the most family-oriented group out there, one of them is the horror community. And Agreed. I just found this mm-hmm. out firsthand. So, um, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but this piece is about everybody. And, yeah. and I know some people may say, well, I don't have much to give. But if you just gave a dollar, if you just yes. gave $5 or whatever mm-hmm. you can give me to help me reach my goal, I really need double the amount that I'm trying to get. 
Sure. Right. Now, now, Ken, is this a what, is this a documentary or is it a dramatic presentation? How would we? Uh, I hate to label things anyway, but just so people can get kind of a a feel for it. But this is not a documentary, and okay. actually, there was a documentary done about these children. That you know about this. It's called the um, Children Crusade. This is actually a dramatic uh, event, like a movie. Mm-hmm. This is, and it's never been done before. This is a dramatization that's being done, and so you going. It's going to be like sitting down watching a film, but this mm-hmm. is just first it's going to be a short film, which I know is going to be parlayed until into a feature film. And one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about doing this is because I want to direct a um, feature film. Mm-hmm. And each one of these characters, I know from my heart what they are about. And they each have these stories. And everybody is going to be able to relate to them. And like I said, there's a four-year-old kid that's out there in the struggle too. And he goes head to head with this man. And that particular scene, you can see on the Kickstarter um, presentation. Right. Now, the setting obviously is early 1960, 63, and then it carries us through the late 60s? No, it, 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 it's, it's 63. Okay, it's 63. 63. It's, it's just it's 63. What these children did is that they took to the streets to for their rights because you see their parents could not do it because they would have been penalized, they would have been locked up, uh, um, they would have lost their jobs, and there were so few jobs at, at the time. Mm-hmm. But the children, they walked out of school, and then children from different cities heard about it. They left school and came together, and then children from different states got in cars, you know, to come down there. And so it was thousands of thousands of kids that came together and became one power. And they gave power back to the movement, something that Dr. King couldn't do. And see, we always see Dr. King on this pedestal. And he mm-hmm. is a drum major. Make no mistake, he's a drum major. But as any band leader who teaches band, your drum major is nothing without the band. Mm-hmm. I wrote about the band. Well put. And the, the children are the secret weapon, hence the, children the title. children are the secret weapon. Um, everyone was speaking with actor, Ken's actor, screenwriter, producer, director. My goodness, so many hats. Ken Sagos, we probably know him me- uh, best as Kincaid from Nightmare on Elm Street, parts three and four. We're going to get to that in a few minutes. But another thing, Ken, about the secret weapon, this uh, this project uh, about the civil rights movement, um, from what I saw on the uh, the, the promo reel is it, it also – you present a human side to Dr. King. He's more than just that picture or that man up on the pedestal. He, he You see his foibles and his doubts. You see him as a real human being. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, yes. And the reason for that is because um, I was born – in a small town south of Atlanta that was called Stockbridge. And my grandparents was friends to the King family. Um, wow. Dr. King's father was, you know, a close friend to my grandfather. How about and, that? And so I used to hear the stories, and I'm told that, you know, my grandmother, you know, used to babysit Dr. King a couple of times. I didn't meet him. But, you know, but I grew up in on the outskirts of that that time. And so and when I went back to Birmingham to talk to some of the people who actually was children in that protest. And if you go, you would also the lady that's in one of the most popular civil rights pictures has endorsed this. She's in her mid-70s now. You would see that picture where she holds it up and says she endorses this this film. Mm -hmm. And they all told me how, you know, that the one thing they hate when people write about Dr. King is that they write him as a god as opposed to write him as a leader or human being. Mm -hmm. Where in my story, you see the human being. Um, Dr. King, you see the person that was a leader 
and you know, and not a God, not a Zeus, yeah. not Almighty. I think it's so important, uh, and an excellent point, Ken. I think it's so important to show Dr. King that he's one of us, <laughs> and this man, just like us, he rose above just not caring to what he became, but he is flesh and blood just like us, and that's so refreshing that you portray him as he should be portrayed in that way. Yeah, positively, but as a man. Right. And, you know, and, and, and the children, the young people, if you watch it, who have seen this, read this story, they talk about that. They talk about how they see him differently now. And that this was a different type of civil rights story. And, you know, and there's a wonderful story in there where a young lady was, you know, she, her and a young white guy was walking down the street. They had become friends. But because he walked down the street and let her wear his coat because it was cold, he was brutally beat up. Oh my goodness. And so you have that story in there that you know so it's it's a lot of great stories that come together where those young people become the secret weapon. Yes, the children were the secret weapon. A mm-hmm. lot of times, you know, and let me say, when you go and you watch just Google silver right pictures and when you see those pictures of water being hosed on people, the dogs attacking people most of us think that those are adults. They're not. They're children. They're high school children. Oh, That's my what goodness. They took to yeah. the street. So over the years, no one, re- I would say a great deal of people do not know that. Well, you know, you're so right, Ken. I always assume they were adults just protesting, but they're teenagers and, and younger kids. Boy. Young and so that's the story that I'm writing, and that's the story that I believe that you're going to be proud of, and that's why I'm trying to raise the funds, because this is a different nightmare, mm-hmm. uh, a real, a realistic nightmare that truly happened, yeah. and, you know. <laughs> We're talking about the secret weapon, everyone, of course, with actor, screenwriter, producer, director, Ken Sagos. And once again, uh, we're going to get back to discussing The Secret Weapon, but once again, I want to tell you all, uh, Google Indiegogo and then The Secret Weapon, and you'll be taken right to the page where you can uh, where you can contribute, whatever, like like Mr. Sagos said, $1, $5, 20 100 whatever you can afford, it's never too little. And you have um, some wonderful gifts, by the way. And, you know, if, if you're on Facebook, go to Facebook and just type in my name and you can get the information. Yes. As your fans know, it's uh, S-A-G-O-E-S, Ken yes. Sagos. Um, you know, in, a, in kind of a – this is a not the greatest segue, Ken, but I, I, I think this might have something to do with what we're talking about. If we can go to Nightmare 3 and 4, uh, you are – I think the first, maybe the only African American actor to live through a horror movie and make it to a sequel. <laughs> I, I am, you know, I'm the first. When you look at it, in the first in an international, um, worldly horror film, I am the first African American to survive a horror film and return to a sequel. <laughs> now, why I say international because in the seventies there was a a local black exploitation movie called Blackula. Of course, and sure. Great William, William Marshall. Marshall. Yes, I, I didn't uh, mean to step on you there. He's a great actor, William Marshall. Yeah, great, yeah. he did Blackula, and of course, although Blackula was dead, you know, <laughs> but, but he did, there was a sequel to that. So I, right. I, I, I cannot take away. Look. Now, my, my when I said it kind of segues in, and forgive me if I'm reading too much into this, but... Um, how did it start out? I, I know now it's more of a joke type thing, but why did black actors get killed off first in horror movies? Do you think there was an underlying <laughs> bit of racism in there? And I'm not—I don't mean to be facetious, but or was it just uh, let's kill off the African American because they did in the last movie? And you know what I'm saying? Do you think there's anything to that, or am I really overreacting? You know, I, you know, as with a lot of things, I think there sometimes you know. 
people just do what they have is in, in them to do. And it just happened to be because that's the way they think. Mm. You know, I hear people who say that they are not racist, but they do racist things, you know, and, 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 and they don't realize it. But I don't have that answer except that that's the way it has always been. Yeah. As a, as a matter of fact, um, I, I I tell people, I, I didn't know what Nightmare on Elm Street was when I uh, was asked to go in for it. But, you know, but as any actor, <laughs> when I did find out it was a horror film and I did get the script, like all actors, we look and see what, uh, we don't look at the first pages. We, <laughs> yes. to, we automatically go to the back ten pages first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still there. <laughs> yeah, and you say, uh, "Oh shit!" I don't know if I can say that word. That's, any language is fine. Okay, I, you say, "Oh shit!" I'm in the. I, I'm on the last three pages. <laughs> this know? is a good job. <laughs> yeah, and so every time. You know, when you get different scripts, when every time they rewrite a script, you get a copy of it. So it, it those, in those days, they delivered the script to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but every time the messenger came and there was a script and you look at it, you never look at the first few pages. You look at the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy, if that's not a, a nice, honest answer for crying out loud. <laughs> what was it like on the set there, Ken? Well, uh, I know I, I saw the, a great documentary is Never Sleep Again. Uh, that's an excellent documentary, and you really spoke your mind, which is appreciated in that documentary. Um, I really don't remember what I said. That's why you, uh, when you tell the truth, you ain't got to remember nothing. I don't know what yeah, I mean. Well, you know what? The documentary was made years ago, and I'm sure you were interviewed years before that, but um, the, the director was kind of demanding, and um, Heather Levenkamp even said that he had a vision of director, uh, yet he had trouble getting it across to his actors, especially working with young actors like yourselves. Um, but you said you wish it could have been more of a um, community-type atmosphere. You, you had all nice things to say about your fellow actors and actresses, but you said uh, it was kind of a tough shoot. Do you remember it being that way? I, you know, it, you know, all, you know, the thing that Chuck Russell, I assume you're talking about nightmares. Yes, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing with uh, Chuck Russell is that when we were all cast, he got us together, you know, um, two or three weeks before we went before the camera. And I think it was a, a couple of times we got together. So as actors, when we got on the set, and the first thing that we shot, at least that I shot, was the... Um, the uh, hospital scene where we all in the conference room when I, I right. go out. That was one of the first things that we shot. So we were like a little family. We was like school kids. And so it wasn't like they do today on some um, shoots. You just come in and you didn't meet this act until five minutes before you was going to shoot her on the set. We knew each other. And so we had a union there. We, we was very close, mm -hmm. and we became close. Um, I think if anyone was distant, I was probably the more distant one, but everybody else was... Why do you think that is, Ken? Well, it wasn't because I was working on, on uh, another thing. As a writer, I was busy trying to write, but, mm -hmm. you know, but we was all friends, and I say that not that I was distant. I'm just saying that if it was, it was it was probably me because I was writing on another story at that time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, sure. but you know, but but we was all good friends. Now, sometimes I think the only time there was some, that I remember negative is that it was so hot when we were downtown Los Angeles in a warehouse and we were shooting that hell scene and it was literally hot there. So I think attitudes had gotten to a point that they was, uh, you know, they was coming together and going in different directions like <laughs> firecrackers on the 4th of July. And so I just remember this one line producer walking up these long stairs and talking to everybody and I remember him saying it was going to stop right here 
I it made no difference to me. I went. I, the dressing room had a little air condition. That's where I went. It was. It didn't concern <laughs> me. So. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, I know a lot of, of the other actors said they was this was going on and that was going on. I, I honestly can't say I remember. The only thing I remember is because Rodney Eastman and I was really close on that set, mm-hmm. and. I know that, well, it's basically because his dressing room was right next to mine. And he appeared to be in love with Patricia Arquette. And I, and I knew that, so, you know, but that... Her that first was, film, right, Ken? Huh? Her first film, correct? Or, or first I, I think it was her first film. film and, yeah. You know, and, and Patricia Arquette was just a joy, you know, because I think I told you I didn't have a car. My car had broken down and mm-hmm. you know, in the first couple of days when we were shooting with Trisha Arquette, took me home. And mind you, I was living kind of like in South Central L.A. and she was driving a little Volkswagen. <laughs> but she would take me all the way home. You know, I was scared for her coming over there, but she didn't <laughs> care. It, I was her friend. Mm-hmm. And she was making sure that I got home. That says a lot about her, doesn't it? It says a lot about her. Um, I want to get back to the secret weapon. May I ask you one more nightmare question? You can ask me many nightmare questions. <laughs> well, nightmare thanks. Questions. I mean, um, I, I, what's it like working with Robert England? Robert England, I'm sorry, Robert England and Helder Landing Camp. Robert England yeah, was but, the big brother. Helder was the big sister. Mm-hmm. And that's how they treated us. Um, what You know, when I first met Robert, he was in the, um, uh, being, uh, makeup was being put on. And Robert is someone that you have to give the highest praises to because, you know, first of all, Robert is one of the most trained actors that I have ever worked with. And, you know, and, but Robert had to be there to put on that makeup. You know, I'm talking about hours and hours before he would come to the set and he was the first one there putting on makeup and he usually was the last one there for them to take the makeup off so and he still carried a worldly attitude a positive attitude and most of the time uplifting everybody Mm. and so you know so that's just who he is he should get a special award for all the bullshit he had to go through to put on that stuff, right, you know, right. all the other, all the other horror icons, they wore something that when they said cut, they just take it off. Mm-hmm. Not Robert England. Robert England's face was a puzzle. He was they was putting pieces here that connected to that piece that connected to that piece, and he had to wear that. And I'm telling you, sometimes it was like. 90 to 100 degrees in that uh, room and with us. But yeah. it had to be yeah. almost oh. double with him. Mm-hmm. So. Ken, when you look in, in t- when you're doing a scene with Robert England in, in his full Freddy acting, and do you, is there still a part of you that says, that's really Robert England? When you get so into the part, you think, this is, is Freddy Krueger. You know what I'm saying? His no, character. Not, not, Are you not, able to separate it, or do you always think, "Yeah, that's Robert England." You, you, you know what? You able to separate when you're working with great actors, even if you is bad, and you work with them long enough, you have to be a stiff not to be able to come somewhere. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and the thing with Robert. When they said cut, he became Robert England. Mm-hmm. When they said action, oh, God damn it, he became Freddy. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I'm talking about a, a, a scary Freddy, his eyes, his, his whole movement. It's his the delivery whole, of li- even his delivery of lines. His delivery of lines, his, his whole movement came. So, and because he was Freddy and they allowed him to be creative with that character you didn't know what he was going to do mm-hmm. so it, I don't think Robert England in my eyes ever did the same thing exactly twice mm-hmm. so you didn't know so he, he was scary and he, he mm-hmm. and he did make you feel that 
Um, and the thing with horror, doing horror, see a lot of the uh, special effects is not there. So, so it helps you to become a better actor. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think some of my best acting was with Robert Englund, or when Robert Englund was there, because he, his energy made you uh, step up to the plate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ken, with so many, uh, you have over 35 screenplays, 14 plays, as a writer, when do you know when it's, when it's done? Isn't that, isn't that got to be one of the toughest things I would imagine, like saying, okay, I'm done. Is, you, is there a point you, where you, you say, you, what never, you never know when it's done until somebody had bought it and filmed it. <laughs> <laughs> that, okay, then it's, it's reality, okay. <laughs> That's when it's done. And you always I, feel like, oh, I should have done this, or it needs this. You're never really satisfied, I guess, right? Let me tell you, I, I have my uh, first film that I wrote. Uh, it was a love story. It was was based off of incident. It's about this guy that was kind of like in this gang, who fell in love with this girl, and she never spoke to him. And he tried to talk with her, and I wrote it for me. But the reason that she never spoke to him or ignored him is because she was she was mute, and so she never heard him. And so the only time she heard him or saw him is when she looked at him, he called her a bee, and she saw his words. But to make a long story short, they, they fell in love, and he learned sign language because he was so in love. Now, when I wrote that story, I wrote it for me. Never sold. It was called Silent Love. Then there was some interest in this story. I could not play. It's a great title, by the way, Ken. <laughs> it really is. It's a really nice title. I could not play the kid and I had to play the kid's father. <laughs> if I, I was going to be in the role. Now, if they did do that story, I may have to be the grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Ken, you know what? You're still around to play a grandfather. Look at it that way. Uh, no, uh, I am. <laughs> I'm approaching that age. You are not, yeah. You're not anywhere near that, Ken. Stop right. that. I but know I, but, but, but <laughs> the point that I'm trying to make here is that you ask, when do you know the story yeah, okay. is complete? I'm telling you, you don't know. Yeah. You know yeah. when somebody bought it and it's been sold and you got to check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's complete. <laughs> <laughs> it's complete. We right. got to check. Uh, everyone, we've been speaking with Ken Sagos, uh, the delightful, such a talented man. His latest project, The Secret Weapon, please go to uh, Indiegogo.com or like I said before, uh, Google Indiegogo, The Secret Weapon. Uh, it's such an important film, important project that has to get out there. Um, Ken... Um, you said people can follow you on Facebook, Ken Sagos, S-A-G-O-E-S, -E and like you said earlier, uh, no contribution is too small, correct? It's no contribution is too small. There are some wonderful gifts that you can get. And, you know, if you, you know, if you reach out to me on Facebook and you say, hey, look, I, just call me and talk to me and I, I, I make a pledge, I do it. Mm -hmm. I'm well, trying to get my. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to get my project done. A lot of buttons. Yeah. A lot of people do not believe that it's me, and I reach out to them. But yes, it's me, and I am trying to raise, you know, like I said, between fifteen and thirty thousand dollars to do my my project, and it can be done. And yeah. it, it can be done. There was a guy last a couple of months ago, I think who was trying to get $10,000 to make his grandmama's potato salad. You know that story? Yes. He was trying to get $10,000 to make his grandmama's potato salad, where in two weeks he had made over $50,000. They had donated over $50,000. So it can be, and that's not potato salad, people. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> I mean, talking we're talking very important civil rights movement. And, you know, what people have to do, Ken, is see the, the promo reel you have there, and it's, I mean, if that doesn't convince people how, how important it is, um, I don't think anything will, and, and they will be convinced. Uh, Ken, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I mean, I, I've loved... I've loved you in Nightmare when it first came out in 86, and to, to have a chance to talk to you, and 
you're, you're such, you're a renaissance man. There are so many things. If people can go to um, your Facebook page, I'm sure there are other links they can find too. But first and foremost, The Secret Weapon, everyone, please contribute to that. And um, Ken, I, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure speaking with you, and I, and I wish you all the best with this project. And I thank you. I truly thank you. And please, people, if you hear me, please give me your support on this. You won't be disappointed. Okay. Thanks so much, Ken. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye.